So if groups don't have the commutative property in general, we can't always trade the order of operations on any pair of elements. When we can, we call the whole group abelian, but when we can't, can we find smaller contexts in which that is true? So if there are places and times in abstract algebra where we do need to speak about the commutativity of elements, we kind of have two options. We can either reduce our focus down to the set of elements inside of a group that commute with everything. That subset of elements is called the center of the group. And in our previous video, we actually showed that the center is a subgroup of the group. Or the other option we have is the one that we'll explore in this video, which is to focus our attention on a given element and everything which commutes with it. So that question, what is going to commute with me, is a question that's answered by a construct called the centralizer of an element in a group. So one of the hardest things to keep straight here is if you just look at the definitions of these three concepts, abelian group, center of a group, centralizer of an element, if you're not thinking carefully enough about them, they all kind of sound like the same thing, because each one of them has this commutativity type equation that's part of its definition. So just to keep them straight, when we speak of an abelian group, we're speaking of a group in which everything commutes with everything. Right? We can always change the order in which the operation is applied to a pair of elements in an abelian group. The center of a group is asking me, well, what all commutes with everything. What commutes with everything? Uh, if everything in the whole group doesn't commute with everything, what does commute with everything? Uh, that small, potentially smaller subset of elements, turns out to be a subgroup, is called the center. Now the centralizer, meanwhile, is an answer to a more selfish question. If I'm an element in a group G, then I might look around me and say, what's going to commute with me? And the answer to that question is defined to be the centralizer of me as an element. So the centralizer of an element A is the largest set of elements of that group that commute with A. So it's a set of all G's in my group such that GA is equal to AG. And every different element in a group can potentially have a different centralizer. And so while every group has one center, it has potentially many different centralizers uh, that can exist. Each element has its own. So you might invoke the centralizer in a group when you know you have a specific element that you're working with as part of a proof, you need to make a commutativity argument, but you don't know that the group is abelian. Right? You want to be able to trade the order of, uh, of multiplication or operation or whatever, but the group's not abelian. Well, if you focus in on just the centralizer of that one element, then if as long as we're inside of that subset, it also turns out to be a subgroup, um, then we can reverse the order of that operation. So here's an example. If we take the, the group of symmetries of an equilateral triangle, D3, uh, that's the dihedral group of order 6. Uh, here's its Cayley table. And so something that I might ask um, is, you give me an element, I'm going to try to tell you what its centralizer is. What all commutes with it? So for starters, suppose that I single out the identity element. What commutes with the identity element in the group D3? Well, we remember from the identity property that every group enjoys that for any G, EG is going to equal GE, because those, in turn, are equal to G itself. That's the identity property. Every identity element is a two-sided identity. And therefore, the centralizer of the identity element is going to consist of the entire group. That's true not just in this example, but in any group whatsoever. Finite group, not a finite group, abelian group, not an abelian group, always because of the identity property in a group, the identity element commutes with everything. Therefore, the centralizer of the identity element is always the entire group. Okay. How about T? Suppose that I take the, the reflection element here inside of my group of symmetries, and I want to know what commutes with T. So in order to find out what the centralizer of T is. So let's get out our virtual equilateral triangle and try this out. Again, you can find a link to this dihedral group explorer here on my website. So what commutes with T? Well, we know for sure that the identity element will always commute with T. If I do T followed by the identity, which means don't do anything to this triangle other than what I've already done, I get the same thing as if I had done the identity, which again means do nothing, followed by T. So the identity element commutes with T. 
another thing you'll notice is every element in a group always commutes with itself. If I do t and then t again, in this case I happen to get the identity. That doesn't matter uh, because it's the same thing as if I had done that second t that I just said followed by the first t that I just said. Right? t multiplied by t is always going to be the same thing as t multiplied by t right? because both of them are just equal to t squared. So every element always commutes with itself. So I know for sure that the centralizer of t here is going to include the identity element, and it's also going to include t itself. The rest of the question is, does it include anything else from my group? Well, what about r? t followed by r gives me a symmetry for this equilateral triangle that does that. That does the thing that we can see on the screen here. But the question is, is it the same thing as rt? If tr is the same as rt, then r belongs to the centralizer of t. And also, t would belong to the centralizer of r, which we don't care about right now. Well, as we know from studying these symmetries at the beginning of the semester, rt is in fact not the same thing as tr. If you notice in rt, the, the vertex we labeled 2 is up here at the top, paired with 1. And in tr, it's the vertex labeled 3 that's sitting up here at the top. So rt and tr are different. And because of that, r is not in the centralizer of t t is not in the centralizer of r. And we could keep going. Like, let's say we test, I don't know, tr squared. So here's t followed by tr squared. It gives me this symmetry. But if I did tr squared first, tr squared, and then hit it with t, that's not the same thing. Uh, you notice in this one, again, 2 is up here at the top in t followed by tr squared, it was the vertex 3 up here at the top. So if we wanted to, we could, we could run through all the rest of our symmetries and find out that none of the rest of them are going to commute with t. So t commutes with itself, and it commutes with e. But everywhere else in this Cayley table, there is an asymmetry. If you have a Cayley table for the group, that's a really nice way to, to identify centralizers. All you have to do is pick the element that you're trying to characterize the centralizer of, and look at its product across the diagonal. So t followed by r, that's going to give me tr. But if I look on the other side of the diagonal, we don't have the same thing. We have tr squared, which is what we get when we do r times t. So this mismatch across the diagonal means that r does not belong to the centralizer of t. If we keep going across the row, um, tr squared versus uh, r squared t. So again, looking at these two mirror images across the diagonal, those two are different. So r squared doesn't belong to the centralizer. But when we actually get to the diagonal, that's the product of t with itself, well, that's always going to be a match, because it's always its own mirror image over the diagonal. t t is equal to t t. Duh. So t will belong to the centralizer. If we keep going, we're now going to look at the mirror image of this product across the diagonal, t times tr versus tr times t. Those two are not the same. This one is r, this one is r squared, which got a little faded out. But those two are a mismatch, so tr doesn't belong to the centralizer. And so too with the last entry, tr times tr squared, is going to give me r squared, but then tr squared times t gives me r. So that's another mismatch. So the only elements of the dihedral group of the uh, equilateral triangle, the dihedral group of board 6, the only ones which commute with t are t itself and the identity element. And so that's how we can talk about the centralizer of an element. Right? It's an answer to the question, what all commutes with me? Uh, and we know that if me is the identity element, then everybody in the pool, right? I commute with everybody if I'm the identity element. But if I'm not the identity element, I can have a pretty small centralizer. And in fact, this example illustrates as small as a centralizer may get. Right? Because every centralizer is always going to include the identity element, because everything commutes with the identity element. And it's also always going to include the element itself, because every element commutes with itself. So this is the smallest possible non-trivial centralizer that we can get inside of the group. Clearly, we can get very small. We can also get very large, right? We can get centralizers that are the whole group. But conceivably, we could also get things in between. And so the centralizers of elements in a group, they turn out to be subgroups, once again, just like the center did, which we're not going to prove here. Um, 
they turn out to be subgroups, but they can be subgroups of a wide variety of different sizes. Everything from the whole group all the way down to small two-element subsets of the group. Because every centralizer has to have the element itself. It also has to have the identity element. So what this video and the last one do is they give us settings in which we can invoke the commutative property. If I'm working in an abelian group, then I can invoke the commutative property with total impunity. I can use it whenever I want to. I can trade the order of my operation whenever I want to. If I'm not in an abelian group, then there may still be some elements, we know there's at least one, the identity, which do commute with everything. And so when one of my elements in my product belongs to that subset called the center of the group, when one of my elements belongs to that center, then I will be able to use the commutative property to leapfrog that element from the center past whatever I'd like. Right? I can take a, an element from the center of my group in a big long product and I can slide it to whatever position I want because it commutes with everything. And then the last thing is, if I have singled out an element, like T in this example, if I reside within the centralizer of that element, then the centralizer consists of everything that commutes with that element. So I can always leapfrog an element past other things that belong to its centralizer. So if I'm working in the center of a group, I can slide an element from the center past every element of the group. If I'm working in a centralizer, I can slide my element past any element of that centralizer. So we can use the commutative property in limited circumstances, even when our whole group is not abelian, if we're just talking about elements of the center of that group or elements of the centralizer of that element.